Is this the week a quarterback decision is made for the Denver Broncos organization? What will it look like if it's Teddy Bridgewater? What will it look like if it's Drew Locke? Sarah Bettinger and myself, we break it down on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are Locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome back in to a brand new episode of Lockdown Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast here on the Lockdown NFL Network, your team every day. Lockdown Broncos is a podcast that is free and available everywhere on your favorite podcasting platforms and in video format here on the YouTube channel, Lockdown Broncos. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that bell so you get notified anytime an episode is published so you don't have to miss out on any Broncos news content and coverage. I'm Cody Rourke, host of Lockdown Broncos, joined alongside by Sarah Bettinger, as well our co-host here of the show. Both of us, we analyze the Broncos for the Lockdown NFL Network and Nine News. Uh, look, our conversation today here on Monday is going to be very slated based on what we expect to happen this week in Broncos country. Sarah, something tells me it has to do with the quarterback position. I know, I know. It's tough, man. I mean, like, I think you and I are in agreement. Like, the, the quarterback conversation over time becomes super tiring. But yeah. I personally, and I tweeted this out a bit ago, I really feel like, you know, at this point in time, at this particular point in time, it's really difficult to focus on anything else. I think that we love talking about players 1 through 90 or 1 through 85 or soon to be, unfortunately, 1 through 80. But man, right now it just feels like the quarterback decision is just looming large, a, a really big cloud over Broncos country right now. Well, let's break it down because, look, the, a decision could be made this week, as Vic Fangio mentioned, his postgame presser after the Broncos' 30-3 victory of the Seahawks on Saturday. But, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it's after this week. But then again, I think people, I, I know fans are expecting a decision to be made this week. So let's talk about the hypothetical as it stands today if a decision is made this week, and I want to look at it for both quarterbacks, right? So first off, let's focus on it. Let's say Teddy Bridgewater is named the starting quarterback for the Denver Broncos. Sarah, in your opinion, what does this mean for the team? And more importantly, if Teddy is the guy, what does this mean for Drew Locke? Yeah, well, I think starting with the positive, you know, because, you know, we like to keep it positive. That's kind of my thing. Absolutely. And I think with, yeah, no, not 100%. And I think that's the best way to look at it as, you know, if you're a fan of the Denver Broncos, you want to know, okay, if Teddy Bridgewater is a starter, what's the positive? I think you're getting a guy that's going to make good decisions with the football a lot of the time. I know that last year he turned the ball over quite a bit. But I would venture to say the Broncos' offensive line is substantially better than what Carolina had last season with Teddy Bridgewater. And look. We've seen this guy play his best football on, on teams that were really good, which is not necessarily a bad thing. There's there's good game managers in the NFL, and there's worse things to have at the quarterback position than a good game manager. And we've seen the Broncos win the Super Bowl with really bad quarterback play. So a good game manager on a team that's really good other than him, I think is a good thing. I think for for Drew Locke, it would be it would be really worst case scenario if you've been like me, I've been I've been watching Drew Locke since 2017, 2018, thinking, man, that guy's got some talent. I like what I see. I'm not afraid to be wrong about Drew Locke, but I want him to do well. You know, just as he's a, he's a fellow human being, right, Cody? I mean, how could you be yeah. rooting for the guy to fail? So I'm not rooting for either guy to fail, but I do think if Teddy Bridgewater's named the starting quarterback, it really does kind of spell a little bit of doom and gloom over Drew Locke, in my opinion. And I think that that's just just a fact of, you know, you gave you gave him an opportunity last season. Take the full season. You're the starter. You're the guy. And then you go out and you give him an open competition in training camp and you you pitch it at, in the offseason as, hey, we're going to push Drew Locke. Or, you know, if it's, if it's an open competition, it's a little bit more than a push. It's like, a, hey, you, you could lose your job here. If he loses his job, that to me indicates that this coaching staff, namely Vic Fangio, who's been there from the beginning with Drew Locke, is, is throwing in the towel on the former second round pick. I think that you make a lot of interesting points, too, in terms of the back and forth, the pros and cons. I mean, we have to look at both sides, and that's something you're going to get here locked on Broncos, ladies and gentlemen. I think that the biggest problem in Denver when it comes to quarterbacks, Sarah, and, and beyond, we're part of it, not necessarily that we created it, but media. Our Denver media has created this issue to where it seems like you're either for this guy or this guy. And if you don't, if you're for this guy, that means you're against the other guy. I think that has been the biggest issue, and it's really trickled down to the fan base. I had a really great conversation with a Broncos fan in the comment section on YouTube about this yesterday, and it seems like that's been the reality. I mean, we're getting 
defensive lineman being interviewed and asked about the quarterback competition. That right there is the problem in and of itself. So mm-hmm. I, I, I like the point you make about Teddy. I, I think regardless, I think the Broncos with either of these two guys, I think with the talent and the roster that they have around them, which George Payton I think has done a great job in his first year, at least on paper, as a GM of building this team to have some talent and building off a little bit about what John Elway had left behind. John Elway has brought in some talented players. George Payton is building on it with free agency, and I think that so far this rookie draft class has been very impressive. We'll get to some guys a little bit later. I'm going to switch it now to the Drew Locke side of things. I think you make great points about if Teddy Bridgewater is the starter. If Drew Locke is the starter, I think for the Broncos, this is a a year. The pros would be you have a quarterback that has upside. You have a guy that can go downfield to Cortland Sutton and to a guy like K.J. Handler with his speed, 60-plus yards, 80-plus yards if you really want to. You have that dynamic. What are the cons right now to if Drew Locke is the starting quarterback? Well, if he plays bad, you know what's going to happen. The moment he throws his first interception, the moment he throws his second interception, or you know, throughout a game, if he's struggling, missing a couple throws, the Boo Birds are going to come in at Empower Field at Mile High. The same thing we've been accustomed to seeing the last five years, Sarah, with the Broncos and the quarterbacks they've put out on the field. And then it's going to be pressure. Or bring in Teddy, right? And I think that that's really where the issue is at hand. I think Teddy's going to be a, a great guy to come in, manipulate the pocket, stand in there. He demonstrated the ability to do it. Drew has also shown us so far in the preseason, he's made some adjustments to those areas where he was quick scattered in the pocket. I mean, remember last year, Sarah, anytime there was a little bit of an ounce of pressure, it seemed like he'd panic and run. I haven't seen Drew really do that. He stood in a pocket where it was collapsing around him, looked through his reads and progressions, which we did not see last year. And then afterwards, when nothing was there, he used his legs, he ran, and he threw a shovel pass to Seth Williams. That is something we have not seen from Drew Locke. So for me, I think the intrigue is, do you give up on that right now when we've seen Drew Locke take these strides where we needed him to see it? That, to me, I think is where the biggest dilemma is in this entire conversation about the Broncos quarterback decision. I think you're spot on. You're absolutely spot on. And and the the point that you made that I think needs to be really driven home is is the fact that Drew can do things that Teddy Bridgewater simply can't do. You know, I, I mean, we we haven't seen Teddy throw the ball 60 yards downfield, you know, on his second or third pass attempt of the pre. I mean, you get, you get the difference between these two quarterbacks in the small sample size that we have. And the fact that both quarterbacks have done well, according to the head coach, Vic Fangio, right? They both played well. If they both played well, if the competition was open, and if you really have the best interests of the future of the franchise in mind or in your, in your heart or whatever you want to say, You have to go with Drew Locke, in my opinion. He's a guy who's under contract beyond just this year. He's younger. He's got more physical talent. He's got more upside. And I think you're exactly right, Cody. What you asked Drew Locke to do over the course of the offseason, I don't care if he hasn't looked like, you know, an MVP out there in the preseason, although – Man, I mean, some of his throws have been really great. And and like we said, you know, if Patrick Mahomes makes that shovel pass to Seth Williams, it's number one on the ESPN top 10. I don't even think it was. I was up at 4.30 a.m., Cody, on Sunday morning. I don't think I saw that on the Sports Center top 10. Yeah. So I, I just I, I think that it's so clear to me. I don't know how it couldn't be to the coaching staff. You go with the higher upside guy if it's close. And I think that's been my stance from the very beginning. If it's close, you go with Drew Locke because Teddy would have had to come in and just absolutely outplay him. You passed on guys in free agency. You passed on guys in the draft. You weren't willing to make the trade for Matthew Stafford or, you know, maybe the Rams weren't willing or the, the Lions weren't willing to trade with you. But either way, you didn't make the trade for Matthew Stafford. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. You stuck with Drew Locke. You brought in a pretty average player to compete with him for a starting job. And if you're saying to the public that it's a close competition, how could you possibly go with the guy who's not on the roster after this year? You know, I, I just don't understand that. So that's kind of where I'm at with it, Cody. And I think that I hope that the Broncos are on the same page. Well, a lot of interesting points. Broncos country, do you agree with Sarah and myself? Do you disagree with us? Let us know in the comment section down below. Let's have a conversation on it. But ladies and gentlemen, coming up here in just a moment, Sarah and I, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into some Broncos rookies. We didn't get a touch on the post-game report, but guys who stood out and maybe some envisioned fits and some roles, especially as training camp cuts are coming up from 85 to 80 this week. But before we do that, let me tell you about betonline.ag, the sponsor of today's episode of the show. And it's that time of the year again, college football, professional football. It is back and betonline has you covered where you get all the latest 
odds, props, and contest information, including the online's biggest half-million-dollar NFL mega contest and the world's largest $200,000 NFL Survivor Contest, which is open now at betonline.ag. Be sure to take advantage of the opening day super promo where you can make a bet on the Dallas Cowboys and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers season opener, and if you lose, your wager will be refunded up to $25, and that is just for new customers only when you sign up today at betonline.ag using promo code NFL100. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your sports action, including football, where we're at every single week. And you can go there, bet online, your online sportsbook experts. All right, Sarah, jumping into some of the Broncos rookie performances on Saturday and not just necessarily rookies, but some young guys, right? Specifically, as you get a little bit later on in the games, we see a lot of young guys getting some action. Who is a player, in your opinion, outside of just the standard guys like Patrick Sertan, Javante Williams? We'll touch on them a little bit more, but who else stood out in your opinion? Well, I want to start with a guy that we called out in last week's shows leading up to the game, and that's safety Jamar Johnson. You know, I think coming out of Indiana this past year, there was a lot of people, especially the analytics folks, pro football focus and and other places that do similar stuff to them. They really, really liked Jamar Johnson, had him as a day two draft pick. The Broncos get him in round five, like a dozen picks after Caden Stearns. And I, I don't think it's over the top to say that most fans were more excited about the Jamar Johnson pick than the Caden Stearns pick at the time based on the fact that Caden Stearns kind of had just a a little bit of down statistical years in his final two years at Texas. So Jamar Johnson gets put on the the COVID list early in camp. You know, Vic Fangio calls him out for kind of being behind, right, in his learning and and getting on the field and time on task. And then he said, you know, this is slightly unrelated, but, you know, he said of Caden Stearns as well, you know, the final test for him is going to be tackling. Well, we know that Jamar Johnson coming out of Indiana, that was kind of a big issue for him was missed tackles. You know, he was great in coverage, phenomenal in coverage, but missed tackles were kind of the thing that not his big ding sort of on the field. And to see him come out, man, he made he was flying around there out there against the Seahawks, made a great play in coverage, had a couple really nice tackles and run support. So I, I was really encouraged by his play. And I think that it speaks to the depth on this team, you know, for a guy like him to be your fifth or sixth safety at this point, it's really, really fun. And and he looks good. I mean, the 41 just kind of fits him. You know, I, I just yeah. I like the way that he looks out there and he played well. I mean, the way that he filled the alley too, getting sideline to sideline. Look, I think we could talk about Jamar Johnson here. I think we could talk about Caden Stearns. Once again, there was a great play. Parnell Motley in coverage down the sideline. Caden Stearns comes over the top. I mean, just knocks, bumps into kind of Parnell Motley a little bit, and the receiver lands on his back a little awkwardly, got up. He's fine, but just those guys making plays. I tell you what, it's exciting. And players in the Broncos locker room, specifically in that safety room, they talk up Caden Stearns quite a bit. You mentioned Jamar Johnson, who I thought had a really good week two showing. I loved his performance that he outlined there. Kerry Vincent Jr. also made a few plays as well for the Broncos. There was a, an out route play, I believe it was on second or third down, where he was tied on the hip and coverage, knocked the ball away. I really liked what I saw from Kerry Vincent Jr. And this was after Michael Ojemudia went down with an injury. Uh, and even just throwing out, he's not a he's not a rookie, essentially. He's a second-year player. But Parnell Motley, he and Kerry Vincent Jr. And Savion Smith had a couple plays, too. These guys stood out to me. And that's great to see, especially after the injury to Ojemudia, which, thank goodness, as you, as you broke on yesterday's show, you know, it's not serious. Um, but at the same time, you know, we saw last year the Broncos had to go. I mean, they were literally plucking Motley off the waiver wire, essentially, and starting him in a game down the stretch. So it's great to see these guys come through and play well, especially a guy like Kerry Vincent Jr. You know, I think that there's definitely an open spot where Nate Hairston kind of we talked about him as maybe being that last sixth corner if they only keep six. And I think there was kind of an interesting series of plays late in the game where Hairston kind of got beat in coverage a little bit. And then a couple plays later, or maybe it was the very next play, I don't remember exactly, but right near it, um, Kerry Vincent Jr. then made a play in coverage. So it's just, it's not that things come down to, you know, one play or the other just like that. But I think at the same time, it is great to see a young player come out and, and do a good job, especially when you're calling for it. You know, you need, like, you need these guys to step up in these games to say, you know, we can be confident in you being on the roster. We can be confident knowing that if you need to play, you know, we'll make the right decision by letting go of, say, the guy that maybe has more experience, like Nate Hairston, for a guy that has absolutely no experience in Kerry Vincent Jr., but maybe more talent, upside, long-term development possibilities. So those are the kinds of things that I think you're looking for in preseason games that you want to see. And it's really fun to see the rookies really showing out and actually going out there and doing it. 
Now, we love watching these young guys play. And look, in the regular season, we're going to see a lot of these guys contribute specifically on a special teams role, which you can't be mad at. I mean, I think that's a great opportunity for them to get their feet wet. And as we've seen the Broncos historically, at least under Vic Fangio, they have rewarded rookies with playing time if they play well on special teams. You can work your way into the defensive rotation if you can showcase that you can play on special teams. That's something that Vic Fangio mentioned. And I go back to a press conference that we had this offseason. I asked Vic Fangio specifically about P.J. Locke and Trey Marshall. And he says, hey, look, you know, a lot of people always say you need to have two deep at every position. He says, but you could have four or five guys, depending on whether or not they play on special teams and if they can impact in the core four, which we talk about kickoff, kick return, punt, and punt return. Guys that stand out to me in those regards are P.J. Locke, who, look, I think P.J. Locke had another great game as well. We didn't hear his name called as much from the announcers on the broadcast, but he was doing his job. He and Caden Stearns, man, I'm just telling you, so fun to watch. The Broncos have some tough decisions they're going to have to make this week as you cut it from 85 to 80. And then after next week, Sarah, after the Broncos play the Rams this week, and they got to cut it from 80 all the way to 53. And so that's going to be a big portion about what we highlight on the coming days and weeks ahead here. Lockdown Broncos leading us up to the regular season kickoff against the New York Giants, who look, I think right now the Giants are just a team that they have a lot of questions. Look, they have a lot of talent on the offensive side of the ball, but they have so many questions. We're going to get into that once we get closer to the regular season. But obviously a lot riding on this week in practice. Could the Broncos name a starter quarterback? That's obviously something we've talked about. Which Broncos rookies impressed you in preseason action so far through two games? The Seattle game, who are you looking forward to seeing? We're going to see a lot more this weekend. Let us know in the comment section on YouTube of Broncos Country coming up here in just a moment. Sarah and I, we're going to talk about Justin Sternod and the Broncos linebacking core here for a minute. Some observations that we took away from the Seattle Seahawks game. But before we do that, let me tell you about the other sponsor of today's episode of the show. And that is our good friends over there, rockauto.com. If you need anything for your vehicle, rockauto.com has everything that you could be looking for for your car or truck. I'm an avid user of rockauto.com. Over the summer, I ordered myself some brand new floor mats, even though I could go down the road and get one. The reason I went with rockauto.com, I've used them before, and they have delivered. Yes, they've delivered in terms of quality. They've delivered directly to my door as well. That's why I rock with rockauto.com. Not to mention, they're a family-owned business that's been serving auto parts customers online for over 20 years, 20 years of reliable service, and not to mention the best prices on the market available. I don't have to overpay at a local chain auto parts store because rockauto.com always has fair prices that are reliably low, and they're the same for professionals and do-it-yourselfers, not to mention their catalog on their website, rockauto.com, is so unique and remarkably easy to navigate. You can quickly see all the parts available for your car based on year, make, model, brands, specifications, and even the prices that you prefer. Go to rockauto.com right now today to see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right, Lockdown Broncos in there. How did you hear about us, Box? So that they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts that your car will ever need. rockauto.com Sarah, I know that you tweeted out on your Twitter feed at Sarah Benninger earlier this week about Justin Sternod. Now we kind of pinpointed in the broadcast on Saturday. Sternod got the start alongside Alexander Johnson. And we were able to see, you know, the, the combination of as to the pressure that Vic Fangio puts on some of these young guys. For me, what stood out, Justin Sternod, he had the green sticker on the back of his helmet. Now, commonly you see the Mike backers have that, but what stands out to me is that we've seen Justin Sternod kind of execute this defense in the last two weeks. He's picked up on it. There's things that obviously he's worked on to improve in certain aspects. But for the most part, it looks like Vic Fangio is grooming Justin Sternod to maybe take over as the Mike backer, which I know we're talking about Alexander Johnson. Josie Julian played due to injury, right? They want to make sure that he's okay with his groin. He should be fine to go. Part of me is thinking that we might see Sternod move to the Mike back or maybe move to Will if Sternod, if uh, Josie Jewell comes in and plays Mike or they can move Josie Jewell to Mike. But you put out an interesting tweet that you feel like this is sort of an interesting presentation on maybe how the team views Alexander Johnson. Yeah, and I, I think that there's some validity to those kind of rumors that have been floating around, you know, and we've touched on it briefly on the show a number of times, but I do think it's kind of fascinating we haven't heard hardly anything about alexander johnson all throughout training camp that's not necessarily a bad thing you know a lot of times for guys no news could be good news it's way better to be hearing nothing than to be hearing alexander johnson's got beat four times in coverage today you know but at the same time i think that there is some serious you know there's some there's some things that we need to be nuggets and and tea leaves that you need to be reading into 
regarding Justin Sernat. It's no coincidence that they're trying as best they possibly can to get him as many reps as they possibly can. You know, somebody made the point that, well, he's probably wearing the green dot because he's going to play longer. I think that's a solid point. At the same time, you know, if you were if you were grooming Alexander Johnson to be that guy long term, would you not want him, you know, calling the defense? We've we've talked about that with him many times, you know, whether in writing form or on Twitter or however you have your Broncos conversations. We've talked about it a number of times that, you know, Alexander Johnson really hasn't he hasn't taken that next step in Vic Fangio's defense as the guy who's kind of leading it orchestrating it, pulling the strings. So why is he not out there in preseason play getting that opportunity with Josie Jewell down and injured? You would think, you would think, Cody, in my opinion, that if if when they wanted Josie Jewell, when when he comes back, you know, if they wanted Justin Cernod to replace Josie Jewell, I would think that they'd be putting Alexander Johnson in Josie's spot as the primary three down guy. But I don't know. I, I find it very interesting. I'm, I'm interested to know your thoughts as well. I, I think you can look at it a multitude of ways. When I look at the Broncos linebacker position, I mean, Vic Fangio, he asks a lot out of the inside backers. You have to be cerebral. You have to have the ability to cover, which look, I think anybody saying that the Broncos inside linebackers can't cover, I think that's just a low hanging fruit narrative when the reality is Josie Jewell has been very underrated in coverage. Alexander Johnson has been solid. And for the most part, the Broncos inside backers have never had the responsibility outside of maybe zone cover coverage of covering a tight end. Now, what I mean by that in zone coverage, the linebackers are dropping to a certain spot where more than often than not teams like Kansas city, they bring a tight end across that zone threshold. That's really about it. But for the most part, the Broncos man coverage for the inside backers has been on running backs because often at times you see a lot of shotgun. And so for example, let's say the weak side is to the right side of the defensive formation and you have a running back to the weak side, a line there. Alexander Johnson is going to be lined up because he plays the wheel backer position. If it's to the strong side and there's a back offset there, or if you have two backs, it really focuses on if this back swings out this way, I've got him. If this back swings out this way, the guy on that side's got him. That's really how simple it is for the Broncos and their tailbacks. They can get creative now that they go into certain packages. They brought in certain guys. Sternod gives them a unique ability, I think, as a guy that can play against the run. As you noted in your tweet, he's getting off blocks and he's getting in the backfield. He's being disruptive. You like to see that. And for a guy like Sternot, he's younger. He has more upside in terms of the eyes of the franchise versus Alexander Johnson, who's 29 years old now. And everyone was saying, oh, Todd Davis was old back then. But guess what? Alexander Johnson was actually older and is older than Todd Davis. And we're having these conversations. So to me, Sarah, I, you know, I, I want to see a little bit more from Alexander Johnson. I don't know. And we talked about it. Maybe he could be a surprise cut. I mean, I'd be surprised at this point, but it seems like the Broncos' prospects on a guy like Justin Sternod are probably a lot more higher than they are right now on Alexander Johnson. That's not going to mean that Sternod's going to start you know, alongside on the defense right away. I think Sternod has a chance to work his way into the lineup. I think right now he's proving it with his play and what the, the Broncos are asking for because we know Vic's defense is tough, sir. And so for Vic and for Ed Donato to say, hey, you're going to be calling the plays. And look, Seattle went no huddle, and I thought he handled it really well. He did. He did handle it well. And it was, it was, it was really good. You know, it's just been good stuff from him consistently. And that's what we've talked about before too. We want to see these guys string together consistently, some solid play. And I think what we've seen from Sternot has been a little bit, uh, it's been a little bit surprising, you know, considering coming out of Wake Forest, the big thing about him was, man, this guy's really good in coverage. Well, to see him working off blocks and, and getting in, you know, in the mix in the scrum of the running game and making plays at or near or behind the line of scrimmage, that's been really, really intriguing to me. I think that's kind of Alexander Johnson's calling card at this point. You know, he he can make plays at or behind the line of scrimmage. He's a big physical guy, kind of got defensive lineman size. But I think the Broncos are getting to a point now where you've got to make some really fascinating decisions in terms of your roster over the long term versus the short term, because roster spots are precious right now in Denver, you know. And, and so with that being the case, you may have to make a tough decision like that, like you did last year with Todd Davis to say, hey, this is this is a guy that we buy over the next three years versus you this year, you know, and that's nothing against Alexander Johnson. I think it's just a matter of. You know, it's, it might be just the right time, the right time for Justin Sternod. And we could have seen even more of that. You know, I think this would be even heavier right now had Sternod stayed healthy last year, got the chance to play as a rookie. So I, I think it is coming to the point where, you know, you can legitimately start talking about maybe Alexander Johnson doesn't get cut, but maybe you start to look at trades, you know, where you could really benefit the team in another spot or another area 
and and a Sternad is able to step into the starting lineup and play with Josie Jewell over the course of the long term. I think that regardless, the Broncos are in a good position. I think with either of those guys, if Alexander Johnson can can play more of that assignment football that Vic Fangio alluded to this offseason, I still think that they are going to be very good with Josie Jewell, Alexander Johnson. I also think the Broncos will be really good and probably have a more unique dynamic if you do insert Josie Jewell and you add the dynamic of what Justin Sternod can offer to the table. I'm very intrigued to see what the Broncos decide to do this year, Sarah. And I know I'm very stoked that we're going to have you along all year long. Broncos country, we're going to bring you daily content and coverage here, the Lockdown Broncos podcast, which you can get free and everywhere on your favorite podcasting platforms and on YouTube and video format. You can watch us on your smart TV or you can watch us on your computer or your phone. If you have Broncos friends or family that are fans of the team and they're not on the Lockdown Broncos yet, make sure you put them on. Send them a link. Tell them where they can get us, and we're going to bring you daily Broncos news content coverage every day, all year long, courtesy of Sarah Bettinger and myself. But that'll do it, Broncos country, for today's episode of the show. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, so you get notified for everything. Lockdown Broncos. Looking forward to having the conversations with you on Twitter and also on the YouTube comment section. We'll see you tomorrow for a brand new episode. Locked on Broncos.